What's going on guys? Thanks for checking out another episode of Eastern Current. We've got a great episode for y'all today, something I'm real passionate about and kind of a hobby that I've, I've kind of dabbled in just a little bit. And so I'm excited to, to talk with someone who's a true master of the art. But before we get into that, I'm going to do the, the pre-show stuff here. Just a reminder to go check out our Facebook group, Eastern Current Fishing. There's Eastern Current on Facebook, which is where we live stream. And then there's Eastern Current Fishing, which is where you can go and, and communicate with other listeners and and ask questions and share posts and pictures and all that. Um, another thing too, I haven't asked this in a while, but if you do really love this podcast, it would be awesome if you would go rate us on iTunes. Um, you can give us a five-star rating there and leave a little comment, and that just helps us a lot. It helps with iTunes picking us up um, and promoting our podcast there when people type in fishing. So um, the last thing is our Patreon account. If you really do love um, our podcast a ton, I know I keep saying that, but you can help support us financially uh, and we've reached 25 patrons on there, and so we're starting to create uh, exclusive content, some podcasts and some videos that are just going to be able to be viewed by our Patreon members. So go check that out if that's something that interests you. Uh, and if not, if you can't do that, then just keep checking out the podcast. We love doing this, and uh, we're super thankful for everyone that listens to it. But that's enough of me rambling. I'm going to bring on my new friend Jim here from Bad Monkey Lures. What's going on, Jim? Uh, doing good, Judd. Thanks for having us. And I've got my youngest son, Robert, with me. Uh, he's currently CEO of the IT department or division of Bad Monkey Lures. Nice. Um, the oldest son's been fired so many times. And we're actually out in what I call the lure factory. This is our garage. So if it looks nasty, it is. It's in bad shape and really needs a major cleaning. I wish you could see the desk. It's just absolutely covered with molds, <laughs> lures in different stages but thank you for having us yeah man thank you so much i remember i first found you when i started i just started kind of painting some top water plugs for fun and i found you and i was just doing a lot of research about um about everything and found your stuff i was like man this guy does it right and i was like wait he's in north carolina and then i started realizing that you knew brian and kind of all the just again the fishing world such so small and 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 knit together you don't re you know you meet these new connections you don't realize everybody really knows each other so it was really cool and uh, excited to have you on here. Glad to be here. And you're right, it's so tight-knit. I can't tell you how many people that I consider friends, some of them I hadn't even met yet, just from buying lures and talking to them. I've got their cell phone numbers. I've got one guy up north that's probably bought from me 10 or 15 times. Wow. And I, I enjoy talking with him. So it's it's uh, it's been, this is a hobby for me. Um, I have a full-time job as a banker. That's what pays the bills. And uh, this is always going to be a hobby, but it's it's something that I thoroughly enjoy. And the price that we're selling them at, I really don't think I'm making any money based on the cost of materials. The, the real payback for me are the pictures that I'm getting from folks and the feedback about the lures. That's what keeps me going, and uh, I just really enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. That's, uh, that's so cool. Uh, it just shows that how how you're how passionate you are about fishing and and the craft and um, and and that art of just being able to to you know not only just paint lures but but make them from scratch, which is really really cool. Well, before we get into the lures, kind of tell me your backstory of how you you know you became or you got into fishing and then how it's grown into um, hey, I'm gonna do a, start a lure company. Um, so both my brother and I got into fishing at a very early age. Our parents took the time to take us fishing. And uh, pretty quickly, I got a passion for it and, you know, found myself sitting around watching TV in our living room with my tackle box in my lap, lure, I mean, lures, fishing rods, and just loved it. They took us fishing every chance they could. Uh, and then, I don't know how old I was, maybe eight or nine, I actually started carving lures. And they were pretty crude and just started learning and I started buying little parts online. And interestingly enough, way back then, in the late 70s, I settled on the finish that I actually use today through trial wow. and error. It's used by a lot of custom lure makers, and it's DEFCON 2 ton epoxy. It used to be called DEFCON 30 Minute. And uh, so that's how I got started. And I continued to make lures. Most of them were top water poppers or chuggers, like pe most people call them. And so... I've got a buddy that I met when I first got into banking and he introduced me to Cape Lookout and I've been going up to Cape Lookout 30, 35 years and we had a passion for trout fishing in the surf on the East Beach. Yeah. Um, 
there's a top secret pile of rocks out there that you can go to and you could always catch trout. We used to never have to go to that because we'd catch them on the East Beach. But distance used to mean everything. So I started hand carving um, lures out of wood and I'd paint them with rattle cans. And it would take a long time because when I actually, I wish I had one on out here. Hand me that red one right there, Robert. Oh. Right here, the closest one. So when I, when I started carving them, I'd had to drill holes in them put weights in them and a little glass rattle in them and uh the hooks will always catch something else except when <laughs> a fish swats at it so here's some of the early wood lures i'd make wow that's yeah, super cool i don't know if i held it close enough but yeah that's perfect it, right there and they still hold up but anyway i started carving those out of wood and i did the line tie on top of the head and caught some trout on them in a surf and could cast a little bit further and the thing about it is so often when you're trout fishing in the surf distance means everything because you're normally casting to a certain spot on the bar or a break out there and i wish when the trout fishing was good on the east beach i wish i'd have been making resin lures in but uh one of the hurricanes washed over the island some 20 years ago we still catch some trout on the East Beach, but it's nowhere near like it used to be. Yeah. And the thing about it now is with these resin baits, I'm, most of the ones that I make are made so that they sink real slow in salt water. And, and I made them that way for the guys fishing from the shore uh, in a creek uh, or from a boat. But I do make some for myself and, and some of my friends when we go where I really heavily weighed them back here and um, toward the back of the lure. Yeah. And they just absolutely cast like a Hopkins spoon. And it's, it's nice to get that distance. And when we do go to the jetty and we're surf fishing, with a seven and a half foot rod, we can outcast the guys that have weighted out 30, 40 yards and are using nine and a half foot steelhead rods. Yeah. So there's some benefits to having that. But that's... Uh, that's the short version of kind of how it's progressed. Yeah, that's super cool. It's uh, it's fun to see the stories behind, you know, kind of, I feel like any lure maker that I've talked to, it's, it kind of started out of, you know, one, they're already a little, you know, artistic and maybe a little bit of a MacGyver. They're going to figure out something better themselves. But it's like they had something that they needed and they're like, I can't get this, so I'm just going to make it. You know, I'm going to make, I'm going to fill this niche because I know I can make, make what I need, which is really, really cool. Um, well, so, that's, that's interesting because I would go for a while taking the factory baits, drilling holes in the back of them, putting lead in there, and then covering it with epoxy just to get a heavier heavier lure. Yeah, see, so, you are MacGyver. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one term that. I wish people would call me. Like, I want to be known as a MacGyver. I'm the furthest thing from it, but I'm jealous of people that are just, like, always fixing things and tweaking things and, and whatnot. I think it's so cool. Well, Well, I've got a lot of your lures here. Um, do you want to take us a little bit first through the process of how you, how you make these lures? And then I want to dive into the individual lures and what you like to use them for, what they were created for. I do. So the way it works is I'll take a piece of wood. Usually it's bass wood. I have okay. a friend that owns a cabinet shop in the general area that they use and he'll let me go dumpster diving and I'll get pieces of bass wood. Sometimes I have to glue them together. But what I do is I'll take and carve a lure out of wood. I'll get it sanded, shaped exactly the way I want it. And here's a five inch popper, chugger, whatever you want to call it. Oh, wow. Well. And I get it shaped and then I get in there and I drill the eye sockets exactly where I want them. And that took a lot of trial and error before I finally figured out how to get it even. Cause I can't tell you how many times I carved a lure out of wood go to think I had the eye sockets even on each side. And when I got it done, they were way off and I just end up throwing it in the trash. <laughs> so I've learned some tricks on that. So then I get the hook hanger or the line tie and the hook hangers set right where I want them. That gets real fine sanded and any holes I'll fill it in with wood putty. Then I spray it with um, some type of lacquer or shellac, let that dry. So that's the blank. Once I've got the blank, I take and I wish I had an example to show you, but I'll take clay and I'll flatten it out 
press the lure down into it halfway. Get it sealed around the get it sealed around the lure real nice and flat. And then what I do is I take a big putty knife and I'll cut it into a rectangle around it, leaving about an inch on each side of the lure and on the fronts of the lure. Then I'll take like the end of a pencil and I'll press indentations around that because okay. ultimately I'm making a silicone mold which is flexible and you need those indentations because when you pour, it's a two-part mold and I'll show you the mold in a second what those indentations do. But it gets, it gets put in that bed of clay shaped and then I take, I don't know if you can tell, but this is a, a corrugated plastic sign for sale sign that you might see. You can see the holes in it. Yeah. That gets put around the clay and the lure on, on top of another flat piece of this same material. Okay. Then what I do is take more clay and I'll go around the edges and s seal it with clay. And you can see where it comes together right here. That gets sealed with clay. Okay. So you've got, you got the box around the lure and you're ready to make your silicone. The silicone that I use is uh, made by Smooth On. It's Mold Max 30. It comes in a very uh, thick paste, and then you have, a, I guess you call it a catalyst, and it's a, a one-part to ten-part mix. So you mix that up, and it takes a few minutes to mix it up, and it's a real thick mixture. And then you pour it over top of the box that I've made, and you're pouring it over lure, and you let that sit overnight. And then you come the next morning or the next afternoon and you break it apart. And this is what you get. This is the top part of the mold. You can see it's a flexible silicone. Yeah. And here, here are those indentations that was put in the clay. So the, the silicone goes in there and fills it in. And I may be showing it backwards. Um, then, then you basically break the mold, break it apart, leaving the lure in the, in the mold. You want to leave it in there. Okay. And then you rebuild your box back around it. Then you spray uh, mold release on top of it. Then you pour your silicone again. So that's the two parts. And what you get, you end up getting a two-part mold that the next day is ready to go. You have to clean it up some. And what I do is I actually take a hole punch, and you have to punch your spru your your pour hole, and I think these are called sprue holes. Okay. So when you pour your resin in right here, the air comes out right here. So that's... That's how the mold is made. And once I make a mold, I can pour anywhere from 30 to sometimes 60 lures out of that mold before it starts to disintegrate. And what will happen is it'll stick to the resin lure. So once the mold is made, then you can really start duplicating them. The resin I buy from Illuminite, and it is, uh, I think it's their RC3. It's, it's okay. a tan. When it comes out of the mold, it's, it's a tan color. And so, in this particular case for this top water lure, the way I do my top waters, I will set the hook hangers, the line ties in the mold. Then I get my rattle in there that I custom make. And in the case of these, because it can support it, I put a weight at the back. That helps with the cast. This thing casts like, it'll just cast like a Hopkins. Um, and I don't know if you can hear, but this one has a real loud rattle. Oh yeah, I can hear it. Yep. So... Once the mold's set up, then I take the resin, which is, you just basically take solo cups and mix equal part A, equal part B. And in the case of the top waters, I have to put micro balloons in there. And they're basically microscopic glass spheres. That helps give some flotation to the resin. Because if you pour a resin lure, it's going to sink almost like a rock. It's heavy. So you have to mix the micro balloons in there. Then you pour it in the mold. Literally 10 minutes later, this is what comes out. It's a rough lure, and I don't know if you can tell. You can see se there's seam lines on here. Yeah. You can see the sp where the, the resin comes out the top, and you actually have to clean it up some. So I prefer, actually not prefer, I have to do all my pouring of the lures in the winter months when it's cold out here because when it's hot out here in the summer, the resin sets up in a cup before I can pour it in the mold. It's just unbelievable how quick it sets. And the other thing is when I pour in the winter when it's cold out here, there's always bubbles that get in the mix. That allows the bubbles to rise to the surface of the lure while it's while the resin is curing. Gotcha. So 
that's the process on pouring the lures. Then these have to sit up for weeks so that the resin will fully cure. And just to be safe, mine will get a ride in the dishwasher just to try to heat set them a little bit more. Then once you get that, uh, you have to sand them. There's always little holes in them. I fill those with uh, just common wood putty. Yeah. That, set, that sets up. And then what I do, I don't know if a whole lot of resin lure makers do this. I put a first coat of epoxy on there. That's that DevCon 30 minute or two ton. Um, and that always has to be sanded. Anyway, that gets fine sanded with a couple different layers of sandpaper getting finer as you go. Ultimately ending with 320. I have to drill out the eye sockets a little bit with a Dremel tool. That's what gets painted. Uh, then once it gets painted, I glue the eyes in, which I buy the, I buy the eyes uh, online, and I'm having to move around some. The company that I've been buying from since I was eight, eight, nine, ten years old, the quality is just not there like it used gotcha. to be. Uh, and I have made the molded eyes before, but it's just easier to buy them. Um, and then once it's painted, it gets a final coat of epoxy, sometimes two coats, because occasionally there'll be a blemish or, or uh, it, it'll pull away from the paint and I have to touch it up. And, and that's it in a nutshell. That's the short version of the process. That's crazy. So what would you say from start to finish one lure, how many hours you have in it? I'm laughing because that's the question that I get asked more than anything. I bet. And, and it's kind of hard to say because I'll batch pour a whole bunch of lures. Like I have trays out here in a lure factory of just hundreds of different models and different shapes. Um, but if I was to take one lure from start to finish, you, you could be talking four or five hours per lure. But well, again, the way I batch make them and, and do certain parts with several lures at several times it's really hard to say exactly exact how much time. And it's also been difficult for me to try to figure what my cost is in a lure. Just because I'll buy the resin in a gallon jug, uh, part A and part B, and I haven't tried to figure how many lures I pour from that. There's stainless steel that I buy that goes into it. But I'm, bu I'm bulk buying hooks now, which I've just had to switch over to another hook. Um, but, but it's hard to say. And one other thing, so... When you make top water, that's pretty simple. It floats or it doesn't float. That That's simple. But when it comes to a sink and twitch bait, that gets a little more complicated. Yeah. And it, hang on. And it gets Move it even just a little, little bit. I'm moving over. There, you go. Perfect. there we right go. There. It gets a little more challenging. I live two hours from the coast. And so I've got a pond across the street. When I make a sink and twitch bait, I can walk over there and test it. So my rattles in here and runs the length of it. That gives it some buoyancy, and I have to put a ballast weight up here. That gets put in the mold before I ever pour it. Okay. Well, the length of the rattle, and in some cases, micro balloons, I have to put it in there, and then I go over to the pond and test it. And I have to take into account whether it's monofilament or braid, because that often acts like a parachute. So if you cast it out, that could have an impact on how that lure sinks. If you don't have line to it, tied to it and you drop it in the water it could sink like this but when you have the line tied to it it could help keep it level so what i've had to do once i got it where i wanted it the right action in the pond then i had to mix up a five gallon bucket of salt water which i had to if you go online and check the specific gravity of salt water at the coast of north carolina you can find it and i had okay. to buy an aquarium tester and the reason for that is a lure that barely sinks in fresh water might float in salt water because there's two differences and I didn't notice until I started making lures so the salt water that I mixed up in the five gallon bucket and got the specific gravity right that's when I would start drop testing them with the different mixes to make sure each of my sinking twitch baits would sink real slow and I have a notebook here where I've taken detailed notes and in some cases it might have taken me 25, 30 lures over a month or so to get it right. Wow. But I kept the notes and narrowed it down. And the reason why I say it takes a while is I'm really only doing this on the weekends. Yeah. It's just when I get home in the evening from work, I just, there's things to get done around the house and I just don't have, have time on weeknights. Right, right. Well, that's crazy. That just shows the dedication and the passion behind the whole thing is just getting it just right. 
Well, let's talk and dive into uh, some of the different lures that you've designed, um, the top waters and the sinking twitch baits. You've sent me quite a few pictures here. I was looking through them, super impressed, and I've, I've been able to fish a handful of them when I, when I was up on the Noose River with Brian Saunders and just really, really liked them. But uh, what I'll do is I'll share some of these on the screen and just kind of get you to go over them, talk about how you designed them, and, or not how you designed them, but what you designed them for and, you know, kind of their the – just going over the the basics of these lures and so the first one i've got here if this one's cool to start with is the the five inch popper that you've designed oh yeah so that that's one i came up with several years ago um and, and i always made poppers for bass fishing but very early on when we had the logo design and started a facebook page i had a guy by the name of ron buffington out to me lives in Pennsylvania, loves fishing at Chesapeake Bay for stripers. He reached out to me, we ended up talking and he said, hey, I can help promote it. And um, I had a lot of people reaching out to me with that same thing. And with him, after talking with him, I felt like he really could. And yeah. he did, he, he really started promoting them and helped us get an awareness up on the Chesapeake Bay. And so that's when I came up with that larger topwater popper chugger. Um, and actually ended up designing a few more. Uh, came up with several top, uh, walk the dog baits, different style, style chuggers up to seven inches. Yeah. Um, so, and, and Ron's actually started his own business. Uh, it's JLS Custom Rods. And, and talking with him and seeing his posts uh, online, looks like he's doing a real good job with it. But uh, Where is, that, where is he out of? Because I've heard of JL, JLS Custom Rods. Uh, he lives in Pennsylvania, okay. in the mountains of Pennsylvania, and I can't remember exactly where. Gotcha. Uh, but he's done a very good job with it, and he's using quality components. I do know that. Um, and, and he's apparently doing very, very well with it. Awesome. Uh, and he, he's, been, he's been a very good promoter of the lures. But just, I, I literally started with that 5-inch chugger, and I had a couple different models, and I've narrowed it down to this one right here. This is the one I like the best. It's a little bit skinny. It casts real good, which when you're out there chasing, schooling fish, often makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, so often they're going to bust. They're going to come up 15 feet beyond where you cast. Well, this lure is going to outcast any factory lure because it's heavy. It still floats. The, the, the problem is even when you're fishing a lure that can cast further, they're going to pop up 15 feet beyond where you can cast regardless is right. how it seems to go exactly well one thing that i've noticed with a lot of popper lures and and i love them for stripers they work so well for stripers but when you get in that nastier water sometimes it's hard to to work like a walk the dog style bait um has there been some some or, or tell me a little bit about your popper like that because when i threw it with brian uh you know it was there was a decent amount of chop in the water when i was throwing it, and it was still holding and chugging really nicely in that sloppier water is that part of your design? Like, did you have to kind of play around with it for a while to get that head shape correct? Um, I did not. I think that was probably just uh, I stumbled on it. Nice. And I came up. I came up with one that w when you pull it, I wanted it to spit some. I didn't want it to to scoot on the surface. I wanted the front end of it to be able to grab in. Yeah. And I purposely have kept the majority of them, the the mouth part of it, kind of small just so you could get that distance. Yeah. It, it, even though here's like a bigger seven inch one, and this is the actual blank model. I don't know if I have any resin ones poured up. It's got a little bit bigger part, but I still try to keep it to where it's in line with this. So when you're casting, now this one will have a tendency to wobble some uh -huh. just cause it's so big and long and I need to start putting more weight back here in them. Okay. But that, I wanted them so they casted real good. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 awesome. Um, the next one I got on here, and this was a uh, you know one that you hadn't painted yet, but it's the seven point seven and a half inch, uh, the pencil popper. Is that a striper bait that you've that you've come up with as well? It is, and I've literally only poured four of those baits, and only one of them has been sent out finished, and it was actually to a guy that lives in Wilmington, and I'm drawing a blank on his name. I think his last name might be Smith, but okay. he ordered a whole bunch of lures and wanted that pencil popper. But I thought I was gonna try to see if I could get into the guys that surf fish 
for stripers up north mm -hmm. and I haven't tried very hard at one point I was kind of hoping maybe I could find a guy that was very well known in that area send him a few lures and see how it goes I just haven't pushed it I've been too busy with um just so many of the other lures right, right. I still got the mold I just haven't poured any more of them yeah definitely those uh those striper guys up there though it seems like when they find something they like they are very loyal to it <laughs> those, they are, any surf caster it seems really well there's some custom lure makers up there that i enjoy watching some of their videos online they're just awesome with what they're doing and they're they're building wooden lures which for a big fish like that they need to have a through wire design yeah um and the finishes that they're getting are unreal and some of the lures uh, manufacturers up there, their their followers are almost rabid about their lures. I'm yeah. just amazed at how well they've done. That's awesome. Uh, well, the, these the twitch baits are they really are awesome, man. Like the the action that we got from these, um, and the way they were out fishing when I fished with Brian, because that's the only time I fished your lures was when I was with Brian up there, and they were out fishing like the four inch and the three point two five inch twitch baits. Uh, we're out fishing the the 17s like crazy. Like me and my buddy were sticking with MR17s for a little while, and then we're like, "All right, give us some of those bad monkey lures," because he was crushing us. But um, I've, I'm going to pull up the uh, the four inch twitch monkey and drop it on the screen if you want to talk about that design. All right, so there's two two different sizes in the four inch. Uh, one of them we call the fat head, and here's one that I did for my son Robert. He wanted. I, I've recently learned how to start doing glitter. Uh, and the fat head is shaped more like a mullet. And then the other four inch is shaped more like a shad. Okay. Um, and I think we simply just call that the four inch shad. Um, but yeah, these are two of my favorites. And to be honest with you, the fat head is my favorite. Um, I just really enjoy fishing this lure because it casts so far. It has, well, the shad has a good action too, but I just like the action. Um, just been real happy with this lure and interestingly enough robert and i really started exploring the newburn area uh, we fish a lot down at southport we've caught a lot of good trout there uh, our first trip this past uh, december i guess it was went there i had a little three and a half inch one of my lures tied on knowing that fish like a smaller bait robert had a four inch tied on and i didn't tell him the secret and um he outfished me that day, and it didn't take long before I switched over to the 4-inch, and it was kind of surprising. Even with water temperature in the mid-40s, they were hitting a bigger bait. Yeah. Three citations in one day. Yeah. Three citations in one day. Golly. Three citations in one day, and I don't think he'd ever caught a citation before. All on hard baits. You, you know, said that was up in Newburn, or that was Cape Fear? That was in the Newburn area. That was in Newburn area. Awesome. Yep. Literally just exploring that area and like it so far. But it's interesting what you said. I get, you know, when I go fishing, that's all I fish are my lures. I just love fishing them. Of course, I'm out here making them, thinking about fishing all the time. Right. And what I get often get a lot of feedback from guys that have said the very same thing that they're out fishing, and a lot of them think it might be the rattle. The rattle sounds a little bit different. Um, but on the other hand, though, I get a lot of guys that they'll buy a lure and I'll follow it when a few months later. And they're not saying they haven't caught anything. What they're telling me is they really haven't had a chance to go. And I've often wondered, have they tried it and put it up and just don't have confidence in it? I, I can't help but wonder if that's part of it. I, I have that conversation so often, um, you know, that there's a lot of great lures out there. But, but you've got to yep. have that confidence to fish it long enough to figure out how to fish it, to, to really pick it apart and um, understand, you know, why, where this bait needs to be thrown, how it needs to be worked and, and where its strong points are. And, um, there's definitely something to be said about, you know, a confidence bait that you're confident in and throwing that. But, um, I very quickly became confident in the, uh, in, in your Twitch baits that day with Brian. But I mean, when you have a salesman like Brian on, on board with you, that's like just, just singing the praises of the lures, it's hard to not give him a try. You know, I'm like, Oh, I'll just throw the 17 for a little bit. And he's like, I'd sitting there just banging bigger trout. I was catching a little uh, small trout, and I was like, all right, give me one of those lures. <laughs> well, you know, Brian's been a big supporter. Um, I was actually introduced to Brian by a good friend of mine, Jerry Cross, out of Raleigh. Uh -huh. And he knew that Brian was there guiding, and, and he hooked us up when we spoke, and I sent him some lures, and he has really, really helped us out in that area as far as promoting. And um, 
a lot of people have found out about us just because of Brian, and I'm you know I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, yeah, he's a he is a passionate dude. He is just so stoked on the water. Very fun person to fish with. Uh, I wish I, I wish he lived we lived closer together. I'm sure we'd spend more time in the water. But let's get into here's another top water here. It's the uh, the four inch dirty mullet top water. And that color that you sent me, that that gold, and orange, and black, man, that's like my one of my favorite top water colors. So, that's probably my favorite top water bait for fishing here in North Carolina. And my top water walk the dog baits started a couple years ago. I was mainly selling chuggers. I had made walk the dog baits before. Brian and a few others were encouraging me to do it, and I finally carved one up and got it. What? what I wanted and that was this one this is about a four and a half inch walk the dog and I think we call it dirty mullet top water I think my walk the dog baits were calling dirty mullets okay um so this is the one I made and then I had so many people at, and I I've even made one about five and a half inches that's been real popular up at the bay and we've even caught some trout on them here in North Carolina I ha I've had that for a few years but I had Brian and a few others asking for a smaller bait and I literally sat out here last summer, kept carving, kept carving, just wasn't getting what I wanted. And it didn't look good. And I kept throwing them in the trash. Finally, I was literally looking at my four inch fathead, uh -huh. the sinking twitch bait. And I realized I had the lure right there. So what <laughs> I did is I took, I, I don't know if you can tell, but this is top water right here. This is a sinking bait. Yeah. I, I literally took my mold that I had put a slit in it for since you walk the dogs like that everything else is the same and on a walk the dog bait you need to have weight back here right the back end needs to be weighted if you look at the factory baits the ones that you can see through there's always a weight back here mm -hmm. um so i poured one and the first one i poured i walked across to the pond and tested the raw raw blank and it was the easiest walk the dog bait that i've ever used so I had it here the whole time and didn't know it. So I've made <laughs> several molds and I've poured about 120 of the raw blanks and have been selling right many of these here awesome. lately. Yeah, that uh, that walk the dog style bait is just, it's a, I like a popper, but that's usually what I'm going to throw. If I'm throwing a top water, it's going to be a walk the dog style bait, unless I'm really trying to get a lot of commotion. Like I'll, I'll use poppers for stripers and, and whatnot. Same here. Uh, I think walk the dog is going to be better for most fish on top water. Yeah, it's a funny motion, man. Like, you never, ever see anything doing that. But fish just no, love don't. it. It drives them crazy. Well, my, my oldest son doesn't like it. It's too much work for him. So I actually ended up coming up with about a three-and-a-quarter-inch topwater popper just for him to use whenever we fish in tournaments nice. at the coast. Nice. Uh, I want to ask you, too, because I tried playing around a little bit with glitter on some plugs that I was painting how how do you or just t tell me a little bit about how you do that glitter because it is so hard for me to get it on a on a plug where it looks nice well so everything for me has been trial and error and the first thing that i did a few months ago when i started messing i've always put glitter in the top coat i would just put a little bit in there always have done that just to give it a little extra flash um but when i decided i wanted to get the whole thing glitter the first thing i did was put a big pile of glitter on the tin foil then I mixed my epoxy and brushed it on and that was a disaster it turned out lumpy it drug it all over the place that didn't work so the next thing I did is I took the lure put a total coat of epoxy on it first held it over a paper plate and I started sprinkling the glitter on it okay. and that's what did it that that's that's where I got to finish and I let that finish and I found once that finishes I can take it and rub it on my shirt to knock off some of the lumps once it's dry. Uh, and then I can take and put another coat of epoxy on there. And then that's what gets painted. And then another coat on top of that. Gotcha, gotcha, so gotcha. That's the process that's worked the best for me. And DEF CON sets up pretty quick. You can do two or three lures. So often, even with sprinkling it on, it end up a little bit lumpy. I've got another finish that I've been using and I can't remember the name of it. It may be crystal clear or something, but literally when I mix this epoxy up, I have to let it set for 25 minutes because it's too liquid to brush on and wow. it hardens up some. And then I can cover 12 lures, but I found out last week by testing a lure for myself, put that uh, epoxy on there, 
since it takes so long to cure, after I sprinkled the glitter on there, it really settled in and had a smoother finish. So oh, cool. that particular, and I'll get you the name of it later. I can't remember what it is right now. Yeah, I was. I, I've been so impressed. Error. Trial and error for sure. I've been impressed with those uh, the, those glitter baits. They just look so good. I'm looking through here. Four and a half inch dirty mullet. We've been over that. All right, let's go. This is a cool bait, and I feel like this is probably a striper bait, but I think it needs to be thrown consistently by somebody this fall for some speckled trout because I'd eat it. But the seven inch shad walk the dog plug. Yes. So the interesting thing about that is. Robert and I had a trip planned to go fish with Ron Buffington and meet him for the first time. It was two years ago. We went up there in June and he was kind enough to drive. It takes him two hours to get to the bay. Drove down there early and met us. Well, he was telling me about all the larger stripers they were catching. So I came up with the larger design and I made a whole bunch of them. We went up there with a the whole bunch of them. Well, they weren't hitting top water when we were there. And, and, um, so that's how it came about, and I've made gotcha. a bunch of them, sold a bunch of them up there, and uh, actually Robert and I went to a show in January of, um, I guess it was 19, went up there, uh, a guy I had never met before, Lonnie Johnson with GI Jigs, had a booth at a uh, tackle show, I think it was in Fredericksburg, Maryland, we went up there and stayed with him. Never met him before. Got up early next morning, went to the show, and I actually had a very good time. Sold a lot of baits and met a lot of people. Um, right, many of them just came just to meet us and said they'd bought the lures before. That's cool. But that's the short version on the seven-inch shad walk to dog bait. Okay. Um, that has anyone thrown it down here for trout? Any, that seven-inch bait that you know of? I've thrown it one or two times, and there's a guide that reached out reached out to me. Uh, it was late last fall. I can't remember his name, but the guide service is Dare to Hide. Okay. They're over yep. in Hyde County. And he said, he told me he's had the big uh, trout figured out in the spring, and that's what he wanted them from. So I made some and sent him several. And I've reached out to him several times to see how it's gone, but I haven't heard from him. So gotcha. I don't know if he ever caught him or not. He's probably caught so, him good and doesn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but I do himself. know a trout a trout will hit a big lure oh yeah they definitely will it's uh it's crazy what they will eat i, I had a buddy throwing a seven inch swim bait a diesel minnow in the surf this past year a bunch and he was catching 14 inch trout on it on a seven oh, inch wow. bait which just shows that they will you know they'll eat large large stuff half their size um another great bait i don't think we've talked about this one yet and this is the last one i've got over here but uh the five and a half inch dirty mullet that slightly larger bait was that a what, what was the idea behind that design that was one that i came up with uh mainly for the chesapeake bay for stripers but it's also worked here in north carolina for uh trout i think uh i don't know if we've ever caught a drum on it but that's what i made it for it's a heavy bait even though it's top water got a super loud rattle i put in there yeah. um which i make the, the rattles i custom make in all my lures and it's got a weight back here. So this lure casts real good too. And most of the guys are, are fit, and ladies that are fishing up on the bay, they like the VMC single inline hooks yeah. is what a lot of them are using up there. I think it's easier for the fish. Yeah, it's easier for the fish. And the striper are such a pain to get trebles out of anyways because they are not they don't relax like a redfish does. Mm -hmm. They're like a trout but they're more than a, they're more a little more crazy than a trout and man those trebles are just a total pain to get out of them um, they're nice to have because yeah. they're pretty sloppy topwater eaters Stripers yeah are. oh yeah it's kind of dangerous too trying to get that treble hook out yeah it is it really is well cool is there any other baits you got there in the shop that you want to talk about any any um stuff that maybe not that you haven't shown yet um i've got a couple other sinking twitch baits um I think this is maybe four and three quarters inch sinking okay. twitch bait. I made a few of those. It has a great action. Uh, one of the two times that uh, we've gone to Newburn, I fished it some. I didn't have confidence in it. I went back to the baits I normally use. So I'm, I've caught a few small trout on it. Um, here's one kind of that I tried to kind of do in a menhaden pattern. Yeah. That's the sinking one. Um, one of the other ones, I don't know if we talked about this, but this is a three and a quarter inch sinking twitch bait. Yeah. This one's shaped like a shad. This particular model is in the pinfish pattern. And I, 
I started fishing with pinfish when I was in college at UNCW. We used to go, I think it was called Shell Island. And at the time, yeah. when I parked, we had about a mile walk in our waders to get to the inlet. I think uh, within 10 years of me graduating college, the resort there was close to falling in the water. It had shifted that much. Wow. But we would go there and fish shoulder to shoulder with lead heads and soft plastics, catch trout when the sun came up, and it would slow down and everybody would leave. We would take little gold hooks at the mud bank, catch pinfish, put them in a bait bucket, throw them out on the bottom, and catch trout all day long. The trout were still there. They just quit hitting artificials. So I learned about pinfish early on, and I had a period of time where we took my boat, stayed at Harker's Island, and went and fished a rock jetty. We would catch pinfish. We, we also caught them on artificials and, and all that. But there were times where we would fish pinfish and, and outfish the guys beside us that had bought shrimp. Trout love a pinfish. Yeah. And I think more and more people know that now. So it took me a while, but I came up with some stencils and came up with a pinfish pattern, which is my absolute favorite pattern to fish in clear water where there are pinfish. And this bait right here has outfished so many other lures in the boat. Now, we've tried this in Newbern and haven't done well with it. And I think it maybe it's because it's the darker water. Maybe pinfish aren't up there. I haven't fished her enough around to know if pinfish are that far up the river. Every other saltwater species is, so they should be. Right. But it just doesn't work well in that clear water. I mean in the muddy water at Newbern. Right, right, right. Or I should say dirtier water. Dirtier water, yeah, the stained, tinted water. Yeah, that's. Uh, I've always, I've never fished pinfish for trout, and I've always heard, you know, that they're really, they do really well. And um, the one bait, the one bait that not many people hear fish that I have played around with is the uh, is the croaker, and the croaker oh, yes. works <laughs> extremely well for for speckled trout as well. And I tried painting up a plug the other day. Uh, I don't have it in here. A swim bait that was like a croaker. I just, I need to play around with a little bit more. The croaker is a little more intricate. Than, uh, than what I, I usually just spray like three colors on there. And then I was like trying to get all, all fancy with the croaker design and I just couldn't do it. But, um, but yeah. The, well, I'm the same way. It, it, I prefer to go with simple colors. Yeah. And, and I'm not the best with the airbrush. Um, and to do the pinfish pattern takes a lot of time. There's stencils and there's a lot of steps to get it to that point. But when it comes out right, I like it. It looks good. Yeah. But I'm like you, it's, it's harder to do that. And to be honest with you, to do that croaker pattern, you're probably going to need to come up with some stencils just yeah. to get it. It'll be easier for you. Definitely. That's the nice thing about about it is the stencils. And I've, I've, I bought a few stencils and I made a few, but I haven't gotten, even spraying with a stencil, still there's a little bit of an art to it, like knowing where to hold the airbrush and how much paint to let through the stencil and all that. But uh, it's super yeah. fun. We'll have to get together sometime. I really want to come check out your shop and, um, and learn from you a little bit. I've really liked, I wish I had more time to do to, to paint lures and uh during the quarantine when it first started i just went crazy and started painting a bunch trying to make a little bit extra money selling some top water plugs to some friends on instagram um because i wasn't guiding at all and and i love it i wish i could spend more time doing it but with the podcast and the guiding and everything it's just hard to hard to make the time but i got my little my little painting booth right over here okay. well i wish i had more time too and it would really be nice to have a climate controlled building to do all right. this and in fact if my face is getting red it's because we're in the garage it's getting kind of hot <laughs> <laughs> well, the only climate control we have is a electric fan yeah electric just fan. fan just to cool you off a little bit and then when you get that glitter out that could get a little crazy in there with the fan going <laughs> well that's true there's glitter all over the house so i do most of my lure finishing upstairs in a bonus room oh, cool because of the bugs and the flies out here. I mean, if you, I used to finish out here and it never fails. If you've got a po something with wet epoxy, something's landing on it. Yeah. It's nice and shiny. It has a little smell coming off of it and the bugs are like, ooh, I'm gonna check that out. Well, is there anything else that you wanna, you wanna dive into or talk about before we're actually at about an hour here? Um, is there anything else that you wanna, wanna talk about before we, before we shut her down? No, I think that covers it. Um, I'm just, uh, thank you for having us on and, and for all the folks that have bought lures over the years, uh, thank you. And it, you know, the thing about it is when somebody orders a lure from me, it takes some time to get it done. Yeah. Uh, we're not fancy. We've got a website with a few poor quality pictures of the lures on there. We don't, well, I haven't paid for the platform where someone can click and buy. So it's all done through email. I can only reply to the emails early in the morning before I go to work or in the evening. Um, and there's normally some back and forth. And the other thing is, 
I usually end up prefer preferring to talk to the person that's wanting to buy the lures just because there's questions I have and I want to make sure I get it right. Yeah. So I think some people get frustrated with that piece of it. Um, some of them say, no, I would rather talk to you. Um, but it does take some time. I try to keep a whole bunch of lures with that final coat of epoxy so that they're ready to paint. Uh, but it still takes, sometimes it'll take a few weeks before I can get it to them, especially if we're getting ready to go fish a tournament one weekend and I can't, I can't finish them up. Yeah, definitely. And I think that people, you know, when they're, when they're buying custom lures to order, they should, you know, you should go ahead and be, be ready to be flexible with timing. Cause it's, you know, it's an art. It's not something that's just, if you want to, if you want to lure that day, you can walk into a tackle shop and buy it. If you want a piece of artwork that catches fish, you might need to be a little more patient. <laughs> so, yeah. um, well, awesome. And you guys, if y'all, if y'all have watched this show and y'all want to have something that's different than what other people have out there for trout and redfish, um, and striper, please check out bad monkey lures. I, I had the, the privilege of being able to fish them and they fish incredibly well. Um, and e- easy to, easy to fish. Like, like, uh, Jim was saying, you can throw them super far with that weight there at the tail and, uh, just a great, great bait all around. And, um, I'm definitely gonna be getting myself some more to throw here in the Wilmington area. And, um, what is the website if people want to go, uh, check you out? As badmonkeylures.com. Badmonkeylures.com. And the social media, I've got it here on your, your video. It's Bad Monkey Lures. It's at Bad Monkey Lures. Um, but for those those of you listening on the podcast, um, just go check them out. And are, do you have a Facebook? Or you said you were saying that now, you, now you're mostly on Instagram. Well, I do have Facebook. Okay. But since I've had Instagram, I haven't made a po- post on Facebook since it, it posts. Yeah. Both of them post together. Oh, yeah, and that's then, true. That's true. Yep. And we do have email. It's uh, badmonkeylures at gmail.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jim. I'm going to close it out here and uh, just thank hang you, tight, Jeff. and I'll, I'll talk to you here in a second. Well, guys, thanks again for checking out another episode of Eastern Current. Uh, super excited about this one. I, I love when we have people on. You know, it's great to talk, you know, fishing tactics and, and all that, but really diving into the art behind rod building and, and uh, lure making and lure painting and, and, and just some of these kind of, you know, passions that come with fishing is uh, really interesting to me. So I hope y'all are enjoying these episodes as well. And like I said, please check out Bad Monkey Lures and we'll see y'all in the next episode. Later.